two or three other sessions. So um, if you don't uh, mind, we will um, record our session for today. The, again, uh, a quick reminder uh, for putting in your name, um, your organization sit in state in the chat room. We'll love to hear where everybody's calling from. Um, we, we will take some screenshots um, uh, with you um, this, and we will, we will get your permission by um, just taking some screenshots. We may potentially put it on our website um, as part of our collaborative activity. You all have used uh, maybe too many times given COVID um, Zoom, um, but just a quick refresher about the lower left about your mute unmute button. Um, the video should be on. I uh, would love to see even if you have lunch, uh, breakfast, whatever it is, uh, we would love to have to see you. And um, please use the chat room and you can always send um, a private message to somebody or we certainly would love to hear about your comments, edits, and any other uh, wisdom that you want to share via the chat room. Um, the applause, um, you, many of you who participate in past collaborations know that we use some hand signals um, throughout our sessions in Zoom, so we're going to do the applause. So what I'm going to do and ask you, um, because we're going to take a screenshot now, is for all of you to give everybody a big round of applause. And in the meantime, I will take, come on, come on, we can do it. Wonderful. Thank you. We're going to do this, and this just gives a signal to those if you like an idea, if you um, think something works for you, um, if you want to honor um, somebody's uh, contribution, you want to give them a shout out using the, uh, the sign. The Just, just keep in mind um, that um, we also want to be sure that your label, uh, your Zoom label is appropriately uh, labeled with your first and last name. Um, you can use the name that you want. So if you look over your tile on the upper left corner, upper right corner, there are uh, a blue dot, dot, dot. If you click on it, it very likely will say rename. And then you can just choose the name that you want to be, um, that we can um, call you for. So I'm going to go back to one more slide here. And then um, just be sure to use the chat room. We're going to remind you a couple of times throughout to put in any questions any comments you have, um, any points of clarification, we'll address that at certain spots along the way. Again, no, we want to hear from you. This is not just a one-way communication. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, um, we had the, the pleasure. Uh, Dr. Chiva could not make for the session today, but she wanted to be sure to send her um, regards. And so with that, um, actually we had a recording of her. She was gracious enough to um, be um, be available earlier uh, this week. And with that, I'm gonna play her opening remarks, um, um, courtesy of Dr. Cheever, and you will also see um, her introduction as part of our video. With that, I'm gonna turn on our video. It is our great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce the Associate Administrator um, of the HIV AIDS program, our persistent and tenacious leader of the Rhine Wright program, Dr. Laura Chiva. Dr. Cheever has been a strong supporter over the last decade and more um, to continuously improve HIV care. And we are honored to ask our leader for her opening remarks on behalf of the HIV AIDS Bureau. I also wanna express our collective and personal thanks for being on the call today and your support over the years. With that, Dr. Cheever, I turn it over to you. Thank you, and thank you all for joining today's webinar as well. My name is Laura Cheever. I'm the Associate Administrator of HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau. I'm happy to welcome you uh, to this webinar. Uh, first, I would like to take some time out to thank the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation, also known as CQII, uh, for the work and dedication to ensure the success of the Learning Collaborative. Um, I'm pleased to launch their newest Learning Collaborative, uh, the, the Create Equity Collaborative. This learning collaborative builds on the lessons of past collaboratives of note. Uh, with this learning collaborative, quality improvement is the main component of all activities. And I just need to add that really uh, through the work of the learning collaboratives, we've made tremendous progress in decreasing disparities throughout the Ryan White program. And I give a lot of that credit uh, to the work and learning of these collaboratives we've done in the past. Uh, the Ryan White uh, HIV AIDS program specifically has made improvement in viral suppression over the last five years. In 2018, our viral suppression rate was 87.1%. And although it has continued to increase and is significantly higher than the national average, we still see disparities in some subpopulations. 
Um, specifically, we see uh, disparities among patients that are unstably housed, patients who have mental or substance use issues, and patients who are different ages. With this collaborative, we aim to create health equity among people with HIV by increasing viral suppression to those uh, facing social determinants of health that are known to decrease uh, viral suppression. Uh, this national learning collaborative aligns with HRSA's priorities and strengthens clinical quality management efforts as mandated by the Ryan White HIV AIDS program legislation. It's also important to point out that this learning uh, collaborative is extending the boundaries into the virtual realm. Participants in this collaborative will, will be virtual. I really want to, uh, I really think that virtual communication will extend the reach and participation of this learning collaborative. And certainly in this time when many of us um, have multiple competing priorities at work, it'll help us be present uh, and attending. In summary, I hope you are able to join us for the uh, Create Equity Collaborative. And now I turn it over to Clemens. Thanks, Clemens. So a virtual thank you to Dr. Cheever uh, for her remarks. Um, we hope to have her or other senior leaders at HAP join us at, at future sessions. Again, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, a few more joined us. And um, I'm going to continue with my slides. Any, any comments so far about uh, uh, if you want to, please put in your comments, questions, what you want to get out of the session for today. And um, in the meantime, I will continue with the slides. I'm trying to multitask here. So here, here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to, um, we heard already, we hear, uh, we can want to give you an, an overview about the literature review that we conducted. Um, well, um, well, we'll turn it over to Alejo in, in a few seconds. And then Chuck and I will talk a little bit about the collaborative, uh, what we have in mind, the timeline, the framework, and then talk a little bit about resources and next steps. Um, I think what we want to do today is to give you the information to make an informed decision whether or not you want to join our collaborative and um, join us in our efforts to really um, mitigate um, and achieve equity for all. As you know, um, the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation CQI is more than just a collaborative. So join us for other um, activities that we do um, in terms of our um, resources we have available, our training, look out for our learning lab announcement, hopefully coming later this year, engaging you in virtual QI learning, as well as our availability of on and offsite technical assistance. We know that um, we want to end the epidemic in HIV care, not only national, but also obviously in your community. And for that, we really want to create equity. And we took a, we wanted to, to launch the video today, but there were some things that we needed to fix. So stay tuned. Um, hopefully by next week, we have all this ironed out and a short introductory video is available to you um, that um, you can use not only for your own thoughts and education about equity, but also to engage others in your community to join our collaborative. So stay tuned. Um, and um, you also can check our website at cqii.org to get access to our to that video, hopefully over next week. So with that, um, Alejo, uh, maybe you can talk for the next uh, five to seven minutes um, about some key findings in the literature. And I just preface um, his brief overview by saying that there are many more subpopulations that deserve um, our efforts for improvement. But for this social determinants of health collaborative, we wanted to focus on four subpopulations. We also want to recognize that there are an overlapping uh, nature of the four groups we are proposing, um, which is mental health, housing, substance use, and age across the lifespan. So we recognize that certainly there's an overlap between somebody who faces housing instability that may be caused by mental or substance use. Um, concerns. With that, um, Alejo, I will turn it over to you and just say next slide. Alrighty. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Clemens, for that introduction. Uh, before I begin, I just want to recognize uh, all of the hard work from uh, Dr. Jennifer Lee, as well as Zainab Khan for, for putting in all of the work and, and uh, research into developing our, our uh, literature review. Uh, as Clemens mentioned, you know, this is going to be a, a broad overview of our re uh, research findings uh, from our literature review. And um, if you're interested and want to look at uh, a more detailed version, again, you can find those uh, 
at our at our uh, website. Next slide, please. Um, so. Uh, when examining this uh, collaborative and uh, the social determinants of health, uh, we chose to, to use this definition from the CDC as kind of our, our guiding lens and how we would examine um, the social determinants of health. And we recognize that there are many different um, ways to uh, look at the social determinants of health, um, but this is the one that we've chosen. Next slide. And now I'm gonna read a, a quote uh, from Dr. Uh, Laura Gottlieb, who will actually uh, be one of our presenters for our first learning session. Um, <clears throat> I diagnosed abdominal pain when the real problem was hunger. I mislabeled hopelessness for long -term, uh, of long-term employment as depression. I misdiagnosed poverty that caused patients to miss pills or appointments as non-compliance. I mistook the inability of one older patient to read for dementia. And uh, end quote. And we really uh, uh, enjoyed this quote from Dr. Gottlieb as it provides a more personal um, uh, touch to, to what the social determinants of health mean and, and some of the impacts that um, you all may see in your day-to-day your -day lives. Next slide. Um, so here are some of our key, key takeaways from our uh, literature review. So individuals who are experiencing housing instability on average um, had about a 16% lower vital suppression rate than, uh, those, than their counterparts with uh, stable housing. And uh, on average, um, individuals uh, experiencing mental health uh, challenges uh, had on average about an eight and a half percent lower viral suppression rate um, uh, than others uh, without a, a mental health diagnosis. One in 10 um, new HIV diagnoses within the US um, were amongst uh, people who inject drugs. And uh, our last one here, focusing on our age group was um, individuals, uh, ages 50 and older make up about 17% of all new HIV diagnoses in the US as uh, individuals 13 to 24 make up about 21% of those new uh, HIV diagnoses. Next slide. So uh, now we're gonna uh, focus in on each of our affinity groups. Uh, the first one being uh, examining some of the disparities we see uh, within housing. Next slide. So uh, looking at the first uh, uh, table here on the left, we see that about one in 10 um, individuals that have stable housing uh, aren't currently reaching uh, viral suppression. And individuals about 30% um, or close, a little more than one in four um, of unstably housed clients are not viral, virally suppressed and about 20% uh, or one in five individuals um, uh, with temporary housing uh, did not reach viral suppression. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to mention as well that this data does come from um, the RSR data report uh, from 2008, as that is the most recent uh, published data. So here again, we see some of the, the similar um, data points on the last, on the last slide. Um, but what we see here is that those with unstable housing face the lowest rates of retention at 75%, as well as um, only 72% um, individuals with unstable housing are virally suppressed. And from our um, Ryan White community of the 501,000 individuals we serve, about 65% or 13% of our total consumers um, experience unstable housing or currently are experiencing unstable housing. Next slide. Um, so now examining some I of the disparities. I don't want to correct you, but 65,000. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, did I say 65? I apologize, no, yeah, 65,000. Because it's a pretty significant amount. Um, and as, as you stated earlier, it's 501,000, it's half a million individuals, exactly. but 65,000 are really faced with housing instability. So exactly. <clears throat> So here, um, when looking at some of the, the outcomes and health disparities we see um, throughout the HIV care continuum, um, 
individuals uh, living with a mental health diagnosis um, are on average about eight and a half percent lower uh, viral suppression rate than uh, their counterparts without a mental health diagnosis. Next slide. And here we see it's very clear, uh, one in five people uh, living in the US uh, that are diagnosed with HIV are living with uh, depression and about two in, two out of nine people uh, diagnosed with HIV and living in the US um, live with anxiety. <clears throat> and now examining some of the, the disparities that we see within uh, substance use. Um, so we see here that about 13% of people uh, with HIV uh, who actively use cocaine are currently virally suppressed uh, versus about 43% of people uh, who inject drugs are um, virally suppressed with um, uh, 60% of uh, people with HIV who binge drink uh, indicate that they are virally suppressed. So um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in, in viral suppression amongst these groups. Next um, so on average, uh, we see the viral suppression rate of non-substance users is significantly higher with an average rate of about 18% um, or more across all the substance um, uh, substance use categories. And from the table, uh, from the graph, you can clearly see the, the disparities. And now um, some of the disparities that uh, affect individuals across the lifespan. So as many of you are probably aware, um, younger individuals are typically uh, the ones that we see lower retention rates as well as uh, lower viral suppression rates versus older adults um, tend to be uh, in care and have uh, very high levels of viral suppression. But the caveat with that is, is um, the older individuals typically face um, other comorbidities as well as any age-related barriers and challenges. Next slide. Um, here, it's a very clear demonstration that um, um, based upon the, the age group, um, which are the ones that we will be using for our collaborative here at the bottom, um, the older you get or the older age uh, category you're in, you, you have higher, higher levels of uh, viral suppression. Next slide, please. So in 2009, we, we reached out to our Ryan White community to, to gauge um, um, the impact of the social determinants of health and, and its relevance. And overwhelmingly, a near, nearly 96% of uh, um, survey respondents indicated that this was a very relevant topic and something that should be addressed. And uh, about 94% or 95% indicated that they would um, that they would want to, to participate in this, this coll a collaborative around the social determinants of health. So that's uh, some of our basis for, for forming this collaborative. Next slide. And uh, with that, that's the end of the literature review. Again, I would encourage um, everyone here today to go in onto our um, cqi.org page and to get a, a detailed version of this uh, um, literature review and, and PowerPoint slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Clemens. Thank you, Alejo, for, for giving us a little bit of foundation to think about why this topic is important and why we need to choose one of them. Um, any, any questions, anything um, we, I missed maybe in the chat room while advancing the slides? Do we have any questions so far? I know this is not a shy group. I know that for sure, looking around here. A quick reminder um, that all the slides, these slides I wanted to see today, but also there's a slide set that's specifically about the literature view, um, thanks to CNEP and many others and Alejo to really put this together. So particularly we believe that's really important. Like I'm thinking about Aaron O'Brien when he goes to South Carolina and wants to engage his program. Um, you, you then become the messenger. We as an organization need to, uh, need to go back. So sometimes the slides are very helpful to make the case for, for change. And hopefully you can use those slides to go back and let your peers, let your other providers know in the program, the senior leaders in the organization of why you choose to focus on housing. 
and hopefully that slide set or mental health or substance use or a specific age group and hopefully that gives you a little bit of a um the kind of the tools to make that case for it let me go back to the slides and we're going to continue there and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of cut back to um about the question about data collection a little bit in a, in a second so here is the a quick overview i'm going to do the next couple of slides before i turn it over to chuck so here's the mission the mission is that we really want to use quality improvement to measurably increase the virus suppression rate for each of those four subpopulations that we identified in our literature review. Those that face housing instabilities, those with substance use or mental health issues, and um, age across the, the lifespan by choosing one of the age groups that we are proposing. And the, the goal is really to use quality improvement and to make a measurable um, difference here. Um, as we said here, um, and you see here a lovely picture, I, I see, I recognize some faces um, that are here today on our call that we're participating also in our first learning session. Unfortunately, we won't meet in person, uh, given the COVID pandemic around us, and uh, but we hope to meet in, um, in, in July, and Chuck has already reserved with the help of our uh, funder a room at the HRSA bill, and we hope that we are back to some normalcy um, back in July. Uh, 2021. So this is an 18 months collaborative. We will start with pre-work in January. Um, so we have a little bit of work to get you up to speed, work on some data issues, uh, make the right choice, which of the four subpopulations you want to choose. You can only choose one. Um, and uh, we, we have some wonderful partners. Um, IHI has been working with us for the last six months or so to really help us with identification of the um, of some of, the, of some of the interventions for each of the subgroups, uh, writing some of the intervention manuals. So I think we're really uh, very grateful for their support. And also we have Project ACRO uh, at the University of New Mexico um, who really help us with all the virtual component of our collaborative. So what is it, what, what's the big picture? So you need to pick as an agency joining, whether you are a part A, B, C, or D, or you are a subrecipient. Um, you have to choose one of the four groups listed here. And then by that, uh, you're joining one of the four affinity groups. So we have one affinity group for housing, one for mental health, one for substance use, one for age across the lifespan. And you join your peers ac across the country for two virtual sessions a month. That's about 60 minutes each. Um, last time around, we had about 120, last collaborative that we concluded in December 2019, we have about 120 sessions, over 4,000 people across all of those joined us. We have four learning sessions um, with the first one in February 2021. We ask you to report your data every two months and your QI updates every three months. Um, we have made some significant changes to that component we're going to focus a little bit on today. You're always supported by our experts um, for each of the sessions. Um, and because we believe that you not only you need the content expertise from a content expert, but those also with lived experience. And we also um, have done something a little bit different from last collaboratives. We actually assign each of the site to a QI coach and the QI coach is associated with each of the affinity group. So therefore they, um, their, that support is provided directly to the agency participating in this collaborative. So we have three goals. One is we wanna reach one in six Ryan Wright funded recipients across the country because it is a, it's a probably a tougher kind of a, a next layer in the, in the big onion of quality improvement. So we want to, uh, we have to limit the number of participants. What we will do is we will have 25 spots per affinity group available. That's why we call it the application process. So you put the, your best foot forward, we're going to talk a little bit internal to balance out a lot of different factors and then um, um, ask you to join our collaborative. We hope to have an impact by reducing the virus suppression gap between the entire caseload, meaning all patients served by your program and the selected subpopulation by 20%. And then lastly, sustainability. We want the efforts of this um, effort to continue. And for that, we want to be sure that you are um, continuing your improvement efforts even after the formal conclusion of the collaborative. 
So the expectations, so that's the expectation probably starting from December, January, um, before we start in February, is to select one subpopulation where we'll make a disparity calculator available um, to really identify which population is the most relevant to you and your, your program. We assign a coach. We also want you to be sure that you have an aim statement handy. So we're gonna front load your QI activities by having an aim statement ready or at least the first draft prior to the first learning session. And we also wanna be sure that you set up a QI team early. I think we have an opportunity here to look at the membership in your QI team. If I'm choosing for instance, mental health and I work with an external mental health provider or group of mental health providers, maybe they should be part of my own agency specific QI team. And I think we have an, a, a wonderful opportunity to really expand the definition and en engage them. Whether they join the monthly sessions, whether we do, do case conferencing with those that face mental health issues and are not virally suppressed, and then kind of brainstorm and, and figure out strategies. In terms of expectations, we mentioned some of them, so I'm gonna do this fairly quickly about affinity sessions twice a month, we also want you as an agency to present one case presentation and one report follow-up. We will provide you with a template, but I think it's an opportunity to share not only what you have done well, but also those challenges that you face and you wanna learn more. And therefore, I think it's really critical to us to, um, to, to really have that case presentation that's unique to you and your agencies. We want you to um, obviously apply quality improvement tools and methodologies. We have interventions ready to go for each of the four affinity groups with the help of IHI and a group of experts that will be made available to you. Actually, you can check them out if you go to our CQI website there, posted there already. And obviously we want to do the report, reporting of your data and intervention, as well as a storyboard reporting. So I think there are plenty full of um, benefits for participation. Um, you can certainly list through, read through this list here. I think the most important one that we found evaluating our last collaborative, which is about the, the power of peer learning, the ability to ask your peers and content expert what worked for them, and to really have routine access to content experts where you can say, hey, Lori, I'm really struggling with this. What should I do? And then your peers can chime in and Lori as well to help you. So framework, um, this is our framework that we have established. So there are the four groups you join. And I think it's worth pointing out that, the, um, that we have a, a faculty assigned to each of the four groups. We have a group of four uh, faculty for each group that will join routinely for the twice a month session. There's a lot of information on this slide, so I've just pinpointed that you can go back to our uh, website as we also drafted a toolkit, which may be very overwhelming for those that join for the first time. But if, uh, if you're a routine frequent fly in our CQI offerings, you, this may, document may be familiar to you, so you can read up a little bit more. So with housing, we found not only focus on those who are temporarily unstably housed, that includes homelessness, but also to be sure that there's um, screening for everyone regardless of their housing status. The same applies to substance use. We, in our sessions, um, we wanna focus primarily on opioids, meth, stimulants, and alcohol, but each group coming in agency can determine their own um, subpopulation as it relates to substance use. So there may be one agency who chooses regard any substance use disorder Another group may come in and say, we wanna focus given our local numbers just on opioids. For mental health, the same. We wanna focus on four um, very dominant mental health disorders, um, depression, anxiety, psychotic disorders, and um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And again, the agency can determine which or all they wanna choose in order to participate. So we really wanna be sure that you individualize your approach here. Um, last, lastly, about age, um, we have determined four groups. So that's children, youth, young adults. We have um, adults and older adults, and you see here the age groups. And by, by choosing that group, you have to choose also which of the four age groups you want to uh, join and make, the, make that part of your aim statement and make that part of your reporting. 
Let me just check on my time so we have plenty of time left over with a question and answer for you. For the coach support, so this is something new and different by really assigning two QI coaches to each of the groups. So if you have 25 agencies, two coaches, you can do the math. And we will ask each of the QI coaches independently of the affinity session to have a monthly QI group call. We're going to use Zoom again and to be uh, via office hour, be available for individualized coaching. If you need more um, TA and assistance, you can either do this by reaching out to the coach or formally submit a TA request to us so we can go through the formal channels of getting approval from, from HAP. The coach is really here to help you along the way to really meet all the milestones of the collaborative, particularly around case presentation, storyboard, getting ready with the data collection and many other efforts. We talked a lot about the case presentation, particularly with those and maybe those that presented or participated before in our last collaborative saw the importance of case presentation. They will be the cornerstones of our affinity sessions so that each of you who are participating will be asked to present at least once. You may not want to wait to the last session. Maybe we can encourage you to present early. And the purpose is really to focus on one challenge, one barrier one success or maybe one intervention that you're working on. Reporting, we're gonna continue, as I mentioned earlier, that we have the measures set aside for each of the groups and we have redeveloped our, um, our collaborative. So this is a screenshot from our last database and we redeveloped it because we integrated the reporting of your intervention into the same database. So your data, um, will be reported every two months and your interventions every quarter. So here are the measures and certainly I, I, um, this is just an overview. If you go to our website, there are documents related to the measures. Um, so I'm just picking one group here, substance use. You're basically reporting on all patients. Let's say I'm a, I'm a program, I have a thousand patients. I will re report on the viral suppression for all my thousand patients. But then I also report the substance use for my subpopulation of choice. Let's say I've chosen those that are um, you, that have an opioid um, use and report my virus suppression for that subpopulation. And my third measure of reporting every two months is the screening measure. I go back to my thousand patient I served and whether or not that annual screening for substance use. Further details, check out our toolkit. There's a, a flyer um, you can check out, particularly for those that want to make some printouts or send it around, that's really helpful. And the toolkit um, is for those who really want to know all the details. It may be overwhelming, as I said earlier, for those that have um, that are not familiar with our collaborative model, but whatever, I, whatever we're doing today and for this collaborative is all already articulated prior to the start. It was really helpful last time around. As I mentioned, our partnership with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, we have developed a change package. So each of the four groups has interventions that either were evidence informed or were emerging practices among Ryan White programs. And we put it together and you see here, for instance, just one of many interventions in our little screenshot. So check them out. If you go to our cqii.org website, um, they are listed there. We know that focusing on social determinants of health is very complex and it's sometimes hard to get started. What's my low hanging fruit can, I can um, start with? And so we, we developed driver diagrams with the help of IHI for each of the four groups. Maybe a little bit too small to read on this slide, but it helps you to break down a very complex issue such as housing, housing instabilities, put them together in primary drivers, secondary drivers, and then also have the subsequent interventions. I think this document may help you particularly early on about where do we need to focus on and what should be our next steps. With that, I'm gonna stop here for two seconds before I turn it over to Chuck. Any questions so far? And you may have missed my, uh, a little bit the window with all the chat room activities here. Any questions? This is Jane from Emory. I was just um, writing in the chat, so I'll say it. So is it an expectation that we would pick one of those QI interventions that's already been proven to implement, or do we choose beyond that as well? What, what's the expectation? That wasn't quite clear. 
Okay, uh, thanks for the question, Jane, uh, really important. I think we really want you to pick one of the interventions that are part of that list. There are circumstances that you have done all of them already, then you obviously need to move on, uh, but we really want you to start with one. It's part of our the reporting system. Um, so that's really our expectation. Um, if there are circumstances that you cannot do it, we won't love to hear from, from you. There's also an ongoing activity. So if you have done housing for a couple of years already and you kind of used as a momentum to kickstart the efforts again, then we certainly would love to hear from you. Uh, Clemens, we have a uh, one question from uh, Lauren uh, that says, uh, "Can regional groups participate, or should each in, uh, each agency within a regional group apply separately?" Hi, Lauren. Uh, good, good to see you. So, um, Lauren, we 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 will not have regional group as we have done in the past. So each agency needs to um, apply independently. And I think the only difference I can see here, if I am a Part A program, meaning uh, or a network, it could also be a Part D, for instance. So the question then, the Part A needs, to, or Part C, or D, or, or B needs to make as a network: Am I applying as a network? That basically means I'm bringing all my subrecipients with me. That means all of them have to choose the same affinity group. Or you say, you know, we only want to help as a Part A program. I only want to help my subrecipients. So then they would in, have to independently apply. Lauren, was that helpful? Does that ring? You double muted. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to note that it, you know we're we're not in any way uh, disrespecting our regional groups. We love our regional groups. Uh, we just wanted to move the the coaching capacity instead of coaching the regional group, we wanted to move it a little closer to the individual organization so they have plenty of support to, to, to uh, work on their projects. So it really trying to uh, kind of realigning our resources and focusing our coaches on those individual projects for a lot of support. Any other question before I turn it over to Chuck? Chuck, I'm gonna pull up the slides again and then if you can take it from here. All right, so this is some good stuff. So how do you apply for this puppy? That's that's my, my section here. So um, we have these kickoff webinars going. Uh, there'll be three more webinars. No, I think it's November 4th, 9th, and 19th. So if any of your colleagues uh, would like to learn more about the session, please have them join one of those uh, webinars. We'll send out some reminder emails for those um, periodically. Also, the, the application process um, on the email for registering for this uh, webinar and the subsequent webinars, uh, there, is a, there is a tab there to apply directly for the collaborative, or you can go to cqii.org and apply there. You'll have to click on the tab that, for the uh, Create Equity Collaborative, and there's a place to apply for the, um, uh, the, the collaborative at that, that point as well. So essentially, we're hoping to get all our applications in by the end of November. And then in December, we'll be working with the HIV AIDS Bureau to help us make a selection for the participants. So this is some of the criteria that we're gonna utilize with the HIV AIDS Bureau. Um, so as Clemens mentioned, we're gonna have a maximum of 100 community partners participating. 25, there's 25 slots for each affinity group. So again, if you're interested, please do get that application in as soon as possible. Um, we'll be working with HAP, taking a look at the geographic representation uh, for, for all of our participants, looking for funding diversity. We want a mix of uh, QI competency level it's always great for those folks who have experience maybe to be leaders for those who are relatively new to the process. Um, we are trying to reach out and look at um, communities and, and, and uh, some organizations that have not <clears throat> participated in the collaborative previously. So we want a mix of folks that are experienced and then those that are really brand new to the process. Uh, they will be able to draw uh, performance data from, the, from their electronic medical record or from Care where or Aries, we'll talk about that uh, later on. And um, we just want to have, you know, enough of folks, I guess, in each category so that we can see if there's some, some differences and, and make those improvements. So this is our timeline. 
So here we have the application process. <clears throat> we'll be looking at those uh, and make selections in December. In January, we'll be having our pre-work phase, and that's when we're going to spend time with organizations to help them figure out how to extract data, also for them to meet with their quality improvement coach, and those coaches can work with the organizations to kind of get them ready for our first um, learning session, which will be in February. This will be a virtual learning session. We were hoping to do it in person, but that doesn't seem like it's likely. So we went ahead and set it up as a virtual learning session. And then in March, we'll go ahead and kick off our uh, collaborative formally. March, we'll do the first data collections as act as a benchmark <clears throat> for the rest of the collaborative. And we'll go ahead and kick things off there, start with the affinity sessions. And then by May, we'll uh, expect everyone to have selected the intervention that they want to implement. We'll continue the data collection process. Um, our second learning session is in July. We do have that scheduled to as an in-person uh, learning session in uh, Rockville, Maryland at the HAB headquarters. So we're excited about that. We love seeing everybody in person. That's a lot of fun. These QI intervention uh, submissions you see here every three months, that's gonna be online. So instead of you know an another document, you're simply gonna be able to go online where you put in your data, you'll also put a little report on your QI intervention there. So it'll be a much easier, more streamlined process for everybody. We'll continue through um, learning session three will be in December, and then we'll wrap it up with learning session four uh, in May. Here's a little rundown of our learning sessions. February, it's going to be a, really a kickoff, getting to know everyone, working on those AIM statements, uh, setting up the affinity group, setting you up with your QI coach. As I mentioned, we really want to emphasize having a lot of support for our, all the participants. So we have the, the QI coaches working directly with you as a participant. In July, we're going to be working on those uh, benchmark reports, interventions, looking at root cause analysis, those sorts of things. Um, we might also work on consumer engagement and some other uh, items there. December, we'll be really transitioning already to sustaining our efforts, looking at those projects that are working really well. We want to work on uh, sustaining those. And then, of course, in May, we'll have our celebration because uh, we will have improved tremendously by then. So here's a uh, little rundown for our next steps. Please do apply. Uh, as I mentioned, the deadline is November 30th. And then we'll um, work on those applications. We'll make selections uh, in December. And then we'll be inviting you to pre-work uh, sessions in January. Our, per our first uh, learning session there will be February. That will be virtual. And then we'll kick off and, and get running. There's the link for the survey, but you can go um, I think we have it in the chat as well. Clemens, let me turn, turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jeff. There were several questions um, in, the, in the chat room and I will read them out to you on this. Uh, um, one was um, by, sorry, I just had them before, but the, the, the um, where was Maureen, where's, oh, Marlon Ray Velasco asked a question to you. Um, do each of our subrecipients have to apply or will they be under the umbrella of the recipient? So there's different ways if a recipient wants to apply. Um, the, you know, the essential component is if, if you're applying as a recipient, we'll need to know um, how many subrecipients are going to apply and they'll, they'll have to be in the same affinity group. It's gonna be, we're not gonna be able to split all these different affinity groups. Um, so in that sense, if you, for example, if you have uh, several uh, subrecipients that are interested in different groups, I would encourage them to, to apply individually, and then you as the recipient will act as a support for, for all of their endeavors. Great, and that was, um, I think, one question that was answered, but I think... Um... Lauren, I think you asked the question, is the application um, per person or per community partner or agency? Um, we have several staff who are interested in. Yeah, so uh, the applications will be for agency, most in particular, 
um, we do expect agencies to have several team members, obviously, on their QI team. So, but it's going to be per agency. Okay. Thank you. Any any other question? Um, don't don't mind uh, unmuting yourself and ask the question if there's any other ones. And thank you so much for those who posted the questions. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Marlon. I just want to follow up on that question. So if we apply as a um, as an agency, so so for example, for I work for the health department here in Orange County, but um, you know we're we're just a grant recipient. We don't we don't we don't um, deliver services directly. We we subcontract with our subrecipients. Can our subrecipients just be on our like QI team? Is that something you would suggest in that sense? As us to apply as a community partner as an agency, but have our subrecipients on the QI team? Great question. So let me let me um, let me answer the way that. So we, I think you have two choices, right? One is you as the Part A program join. That means that the subrecipients all have to choose the same population of the same affinity group. Let's say they all focus on housing or substance use. So that would be one parameter. So um, if that's the case, then you then you would be you as the lead agency would be the one who submits the application, you that collects the data from everyone and submits it, and you're the one who coordinates. At the affinity session, you can certainly invite more agency to subrecipients to join the affinity group, but you would be basically the, the coordinator, the manager for that effort. So that would be option one. Or um, the second option, if if your subrecipients go in different direction, you want to be rather helping them, then the subrecipients can certainly join independently the collaborative. I hope, was that helpful to you, Marlon? Oh, yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. I mean, uh, and one last question we have uh, from Marcy. Um, she, she has a, uh, a question about ideas for getting data. Um, okay. Marcy, do you think you could uh, elaborate on your point? I'm unmuted. I find that a lot of our um, our uh, folks in the field are don't have access to great data to um, look at um, as fine tuning. You know, it was really hard to get uh, the data last time for many, and certainly using um, determinants of health is they're not ready yet. So I think this is perfect to push them to get ready. But do you have other, um, I mean, learning from others, how they have um, integrated, how they've moved forward to doing that? Great question. I think one. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm just don't know if I'm expressing myself right. No, no, I think, I think many, many programs will, will will be struggling with getting the data routinely because we are now not only looking at the basic information that's already captured, but I think we are now looking for more detailed information. So for instance, if I have uh, want to focus on patients who have alcohol issues, you know, that that's maybe not captured, maybe it's captured, but not routinely reported. So then you have to develop a reporting mechanism. We certainly recognize that. Um, what we willing to do a, you don't have to report something next month or next week, right? So if you join, then the first data collection cycle is in March. So we have a little bit of support, time for support to help you just to. The second thing we will do is we have worked, um, we wanna give credit where credit is due with several people who helped us last time around to develop an RSR reporting module so that you can just take that plug into your system so that if you, if you are an RSR user, then you can actually get the information out based on those custom reports that can be implemented and, and imported. Obviously, with Marcy, I know that um, California is not using the um, RSR really. That's, I think you're an ears um, state. So um, we have to work that out a little bit, but I hope that this peer learning I mentioned earlier can help you a little bit. I recognize that it's for many it will be very struggling, but what we wanna do is we don't wanna wait a year to know what is your rate for opioid, what's your rate for this. And so we need to figure out how we can systematize and make it easier for everyone. So if I have a program, I'm, I'm a hypothetic program who does not know how to get the data ever out and they do everything by paper, which hopefully no one will do at this day and age, 
then you may not be the right one because you can't go through thousands of records every two months. Um, you probably need it more than anybody else. Um, but I think we part of this capacity building is to automate the reporting of increasingly more complex reports that we need. Because we, the epidemic will be only ended if we look at the subpopulations and they go smaller and smaller in numbers and they will be more increasingly complicated to measure. I see an, a lot of nodding hands for those who participated last time around and it was a little bit easier, but this time around it will be more complex. Good point. Okay, I will quickly uh, wrap this up and then we have a few more questions and we certainly, Chuck and I and Aleka and many others will be hanging around. So if you didn't want to ask, you were too shy to ask, we, we certainly um, hang in the, in, the, in the Zoom for much longer. So we want to recognize a lot of individuals who helped us with this. So here are a few special thanks, not only to HAP staff who were incredibly helpful to Marlene and, and Chap, our project officer, um, with our CQI staff, our consultants um, that really help, will help us and have helped us already with the development, but also our partners at UCSF, University of New Mexico, IHI, and Impact Marketing, who has developed um, with us those beautiful um, logos that you have seen already. With that, um, I'm going to take my slides down and open up for any other questions, comments, and also reflections um, for, for those of you who are like, I'm a little bit on the fence, or for those of you who participated before, um, what, what your thoughts are about kind of readjusting a little bit of our collaborative model to go to address social determinants of health. Um, we just have a follow-up from Marcy about, um, about getting mental health data. So are, are you talking about how to get data out of your medical record system or mental health data about national data sets? Marcy, you may have to unmute. Uh, okay, I'm on uh, privacy. That's what I'm thinking about. Okay. So first of all, um, just to clarify a couple of points in, in your A, we are not asking for any patient specific data when you report the data to us. So this is a facility agency reported data. So if you have a thousand patients, you basically tell us the numerator and denominator for that. So for everyone and then plus your subpopulation, which may be 200, and then you tell us numerator and denominator. So there, that will be not for us. In your case, you need to address the, the privacy concerns that you have um, in any data system that you have. Um, so when you have, for instance, you integrate the housing provider that's external to your agency and you wanna do case conferencing every week about those housing uh, that face housing instabilities and do not have virally suppressed, maybe you wanna invite it, but you have to address that regardless of this collaborative or not. Any other questions, comments? Aaron, I'm looking at you or Dan, what, what do you think about how this plays out and and any, any thoughts on your end? Would love to hear. Um, so I'll just, I'll, first of all, I'll just reassure Marcy that um, these guys will work with you to help you get the data that you need to, to participate in this meaningfully. Um, and if you don't get it right on day one, that's fine too. Uh, they'll help you with that. And in fact, when you submit your data in the database, it, you actually have an opportunity to, to detail any data collection issues that you have, um, um, assuming that's still gonna be part of the database. And then just as a, as a general kind of um, arm twist for anyone that's on the fence about whether to participate in this, um, participating in these campaigns gives you so much ammunition to then go on to, to grant funders uh, back to HRSA, I've presented at the Ryan White conference, and it was all spawned by activities that we undertook as part of a, a CQII collaborative. Um, so you end up with this um, catalog of information documents that you can then use to, to brag about your program after the fact. So I would highly encourage anyone that hasn't participated in one of these 
campaigns to to sign up and and get your application in because it really is a wonderful opportunity for for your patients and for your program and i'm not being paid by cqii to say that <laughs> checks in the mail <laughs> thanks jack <laughs> and i would just echo what aaron said i think in addition for us um, it's been very invaluable to just get the input and suggestions and ideas from others who are doing the work across the country um, and seeing what can work at our clinic um, and how we can all work together to try to help improve, um, you know, together. And so, um, you know, that's been very, very valuable. And I know the last time we were doing um, some work as well with the net, um, you know, on some QI just in general with, with um, better educating the staff on QI tools and things and having that one-on-one -on -one coaching with her during that time was, 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 was awesome. And so I'm excited to see that that's part of this component for this collaborative because you really can't go wrong with having someone there to, um, you know, talk through ideas or if you have barriers and you're really, really stuck and can't figure out maybe a solution to, to have someone that, that um, can assist you, whether it's your coach or whether it's other people in the field doing the work, um, it's, it's been phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to this. Thank you for your paid infomercials here, uh, unpaid. Um, so any other questions, comments? So how does everybody feel about, do you have enough information? What else is needed? And again, the offer from CQII, we can join you at your next QI meeting virtually. Uh, we can set up a call, a Zoom with your senior leaders to convince them it's worthy of your time and effort. Um, Chuck and I will go virtual on our road trip um, to where, wherever is needed. Um, give you a reference point. Last time around, we had about 50 to 100 calls with sites that we're interested in and they want to further clarify. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. I think for us, it's really important that you understand not only the, the offer, but also the commitment that you're making. Um, and because it is really a slightly different and the, the bar, we want to raise the bar and we don't want to be cookie cutter. So therefore we really spend a lot of time over the last many months to really think this through to make it meaningful, but also worthy of your time and effort. Okay. We want to give you a way out um, because we are over, over our 60 minutes, but if you want to stay uh, a little bit longer, you're happy to do so um, because if you have any questions and you were too shy before, we're happy to answer them. So everybody, I'm going to stop the recording.